1924, Professor Raymond Dart was given a skull which changed the story of our species forever. The so-called tongue child fundamentally altered what it means to be human and created a bitter controversy which divided the scientific world for decades. This might be one of the most famous stories of human evolution, but 100 years later, I believe we haven't even come close to fully digesting the implications of this discovery. Really getting to grips with the story of the tongue child will lead us to a place where our expectations begin to fail, where the ground turns to quicksand beneath our feet, and where everything we thought we knew about humanity crumbles away. This little fossil changed our understanding of human evolution, but it can still change the world. So what is the tongue child? And what can it tell us about who we are? Fuck off. As you can see, I'm in South Africa, near the Botswana border, the home of the tongue child, and spending a little bit of time in the bushveld. While not identical, this environment is actually quite analogous to that the tongue child would have lived in, filled with carnivorous cats, giant rhinos and elephants, and troops of dog-faced baboons. But who, or what, is the tongue child? So this fossil was the first known example of the hominid called Australopithecus, the southern ape, an ancestor of humans who lived between two and three million years ago. And what were they like? Well, they were short, well under five foot tall, and they retained many ape-like features, such as long arms, robust jaws, and a brain little bigger than that of a chimpanzee. But the world these guys lived in was an absolute horror show. Indeed, Australopithecus fossils are often found in caves not because they lived in them, but because they were dragged there. The Tong child, for example, was only three years old at the time of death, and a 2006 analysis suggested that he was killed by an African crowned eagle. On top of eagles, leopards, and crocodiles, Australopithecus had to avoid giant hyenas, saber-toothed cats, and monstrous baboons over twice as large as Australopithecus was. But what is it that made this fossil so different to any other beleaguered savanna primate? The key lay in the placement of the foramen magnum, the place where the spine connects with the skull. In the tongue child, this lay directly beneath the cranium, suggesting an upright posture. So this, was an animal walking on two legs. Combined with a smaller human-like face and teeth, Tong's anatomy suggested that this was no monkey, but something far closer to us. Now, this evidence may seem straightforward and convincing that, but when it was unveiled to the world exactly 100 years ago, Australopithecus was rejected as a human ancestor by the scientific community. Why? In 1912, an amateur archaeologist called Charles Dawson stunned the world with his discovery of a skull in a quarry in East Sussex, England. Big-brained, big-jawed, and certifiably European, the so-called Piltdown Man was hailed as the missing link between man and ape. As you can imagine, the image of this he-man hominid strutting nobly across the prehistoric South Downs tickled the fancy of many a scientist working at the height of the British Empire. Perhaps Britain had not just given the world cricket and railroads, but the human species itself. Compared to Piltdown Man, Dart's hairy African hobbit was a grave disappointment. In fact, it received a frigid response. Sir Arthur Keith, Dart's very own mentor and a titan of the anthropological world, dismissed the tongue child as merely the skull of a baby chimp or gorilla. And yet, not everyone was so easily convinced by Piltdown, and several savvier scientists smelled a rat. As early as 1913, papers were being published which cast doubt on the find. But Piltdown Man remained broadly accepted until 1953, when a team of scientists definitively proved it was a hoax. Dart's theories, on the other hand, backed by increasing fossil evidence, were finally vindicated. How had scientists got this so badly wrong? While the hoax was expertly made, it does seem that certain scientists believed what they wanted to believe. So Arthur Keith, for example, his reaction to Tong Child was definitely colored by his attachment to scientific racism. Or I should say, scientific racism. For a mind warped by the belief that Africans were subhuman had great interest in denying that the human species itself came from Africa. But many had not wanted to believe that a mere two million years ago, our ancestors had been silly, upright chimps. But here is the thing. Australopithecus was not just a silly upright chimp. Because beneath the differences between Australopithecus and modern humans lie many layers of sameness. It is these commonalities, when properly appreciated, which might alter the way we see the world. It was because of their primitive appearance 
that Australopithecus was wildly underestimated. The dividing line between Australopiths and true Homo was initially drawn over the issue of tool use. But in 2010, scientists uncovered evidence of Australopiths using stone tools to butcher animal carcasses. And this was from 3.4 million years ago. Anatomical studies suggest that Australopithecus females may have struggled with childbirth and may have even needed to rotate the baby in the womb to give birth. This rotation may just have required the assistance of hairy midwives, which suggests a startlingly human level of cooperation. But most remarkable of all is the discovery in 1925, the same year the tongue child was revealed to the world, of one little stud. The Makapanskhat pebble is one of the most extraordinary artifacts ever found anywhere Ever. So it's a naturally occurring pebble, it's unmodified by anyone. But here's the catch. The pebble was foreign to the cave in which it was found. In fact, it had to be carried some 20 miles from a riverbed to the place of its discovery. So the leading theory is that an Australopithecus actually picked up this stone and carried it there three million years ago. Why would they do this? Well, look at the pebble and it's unmistakable. You can see a face, a bulging jaw, even a pretty distinct hairline. In fact, if you turn the pebble over, there's a second face with a much broader grip. So this stone could have been rotated and ogled at from different angles and provided entertainment for minutes or hours. We know the phenomenon of pareidolia, the detection of faces in the natural world, including in inanimate objects, is widespread in the animal kingdom. What did Australopithecus think of this stone? What joy, reverence, or fear did it evoke? Or was it a mere curiosity? The Makapan's Khat pebble reveals an intelligence more subtle, more symbolic than the apish anatomy of Australopithecus would suggest. And this is the crucial point. The story of Australopithecus exposes just how superficial our intuitions are and how untrustworthy. Even esteemed scientists rejected the tongue child's connection to humanity because it didn't conform with expectations. But the fact this animal was unhuman-like was a terrible indicator of its sophistication. This is the curse of anthropocentrism, our tendency to put human beings at the center of everything. The more different to a human something is, the less intelligent and less valuable we assume it to be. But this is wrong provably and even horrifyingly wrong. For this bias so neatly challenged by Australopithecus has led to moral travesties. But if we take a leap here and accept that our intuitions about other species may be faulty, then we open the door for a moral revolution. And if we have the courage to follow this path, it may just lead to a better world. Just as scientists dismissed the tongue child because it didn't conform with our expectations, so the majority of humanity today dismiss non-human animals. 97.5% of all sentient life because they don't conform with ours. And if Tong taught us that humanity was more animal than we wanted to believe, then today's science is showing us that animals are more human than we've allowed ourselves to see. In 2002, Dr. Lynn Sneddon discovered the presence of nociceptors in fish. These are nerve endings sensitive to heat, pressure, and chemicals, which are associated with the experience of pain in human beings. Researchers then began to pay closer attention to fish behavior, and evidence began to mount. Fast forward to 2025, and there is a wide consensus. Fish feel pain. Now, research is beginning to suggest that animals wildly different to us, so puny and alien that their lives have ever been considered meaningless can too feel pain. These are animals like houseflies, honeybees, and shrimp. I understand the desire to scoff. I do. But consider for a moment if that scoff sounds so much like an echo of those scientists who rejected the tongue child out of hand because they already thought they knew better. And evidence supporting the sentience of those bigger-brained animals we industrially farm for food is even stronger. Newborn piglets will run towards their mother's voices, which they can recognize from only two weeks old. Chicks raised without their mothers, as they tend to be in factory farming settings, exhibit higher levels of fearfulness and even antisocial behavior, more frequently pecking the birds around them. Cows even have best friends and get stressed when they're separated from them. Literally trillions of thinking, feeling, social animals on a sentient spectrum from shrimp to pigs are killed for human use every single year. The Tong child shows us that complex intelligence developed well before the evolution of big brains. But that intelligence stretches way further back and way further forward than Australopithecus. It is a quality that falls like a mantle 
across the entirety of the animal kingdom. Now, it may vary and diversify in many ways that we're still blind to, but if Tong's story shows us anything, it is that difference does not erode kinship. For we, human beings like you and I, we were once apish, hairy and animal-like, starved of compassion by the wide savanna. If a relict population of Australopithecus was discovered today, would we place them under rifle scopes or prod them into slaughterhouses because of their difference? Or would we notice that that twinkling life behind their eyes is the same germ of consciousness which blossoms within us? and within all the tortured animals of the world like so many flowers. Fossils like the Tong Child or the Makapan's Khat Pebble change the world, but they can change it far further still. Their discovery changed what it means to be human, but now they should also change what it means to be animal. The Tong Child shocked the world because it showed how much animal there was in humanity, that we were far more apish far more recently than anyone expected. But for an age of industrial animal cruelty, this tiny new skull poses a revolutionary new question. How much humanity is there in animals? Thanks for watching.